those sitting in our pews. Hello to everyone who is watching us online. Thank you for people watching us online. You've been very faithful every week. It's been great seeing everyone who's tied into us and watching us from afar. And you're probably wondering, that's it. what's Monday Thursday all about? What's this Monday thing? I shall tell you. Monday is actually a shortened word for the, uh, the Latin word mandatum, which is, means command. And so one of the commands we're going to be looking at tonight is do this in remembrance of me. Another command that's celebrated usually on Monday Thursday is the foot washing, where Jesus commands his disciples to do as he has done. So that's what we call it. Monday Thursday. It comes from the word mandatum. So there you go. Learned something already, and we haven't even sung the first hymn yet. We're going to be working out of both the green hymnal and the blue hymnal this evening. Uh, the only other announcement I have is that on Saturday, down at Emmanuel Lutheran Church down in Strum, we'll be having a service for Margaret at that time. Visitation will be from 10 to 11, and the funeral service will be at 11 a.m. That'll be down at Emmanuel Lutheran down in Strum. All right, Ken, we'll bring us into the presence of the Lord here uh, with some music and a prelude, and just have you ask you to open your hearts and minds to uh, what God has to say for you tonight and put on your heart because he will definitely have something for you. Yeah. 
Good evening. First lesson tonight is from Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. The psalm is Psalm 116, verses 11 through 17, found on page 272 in the Green Hymnal. We will read responsibly, and I will start with verse 11. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my house to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. The second lesson is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 15 through 25. And here we find the words of the Lord being repeated so that you make no mistake of his promise. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so, for he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, said the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them in their, on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when the sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. This is the end of the second reading. Please stand as you are able for the gospel. Together. 
Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. He replied, as soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. They went off to the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I had been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my, before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Do this to remember me, Jesus says. Remember, remember. Do you have trouble forgetting things? I see some smiles out there. Like forgetting where you put your keys or someone's name or, or a birthday. One of my favorite lines I'm asked if I have remembered something is to say, don't ask me, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast. It's said, actually, that there's only three kinds of memory. A good memory, a bad memory, and a convenient memory. Is that true, guys? Yes, we are a forgetful people. And so we come up with all kinds of ways to help us remember. Like strings around our fingers and post-it notes and alarms on our phones. I have a post-it note app on my phone that helps remind me to check my reminders. <laughs> now, most of us do need a little help to remember. Not only do we forget names and where we put our keys, there's also times when we also maybe forget God and all that he has done for us. That's why throughout the Bible, God's people are told over and over to remember him. But here's some examples from Scripture telling God's people to remember. We take a look, go back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verse 18. It says, remember what the Lord your God did. A few chapters later, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 18, Scripture says, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that your Lord, your God, redeemed you from your slavery. Psalm 105, verse 5, reminds us to remember the wonders He has performed. And the Lord proclaims in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 5, don't forget my words or turn away from them. Now that word remember comes from the Hebrew word zachar, which not only means to remember, but actually has the context of to continually remember. The problem is, though, is we are forgetful people. And that's why God, throughout his holy word, tells us to remember. So for thousands of years, God's people have had a memorial feast in which they were commanded to observe in order to remember how God had delivered them. Today's message is titled, 
do this to remember me. Some of your versions might say, do this in remembrance of me. These words are used as part of the great thanksgiving every time we celebrate communion. But why do we use those words? Let's take a closer look at our gospel passage for this evening and see the significance of why we celebrate communion. Now, one of the, more, the important things we always need to consider when we study scripture is the context of the when, what, how, and why the author wrote those words. And one important part of the context of what we call the Lord's Supper in our gospel text is that is the timing of this holy event. Folks, it was no accident that this night in the upper room fell on the very night of the Passover celebration. That's because the Passover was a night that God's people had observed almost every year as a special memorial feast which was celebrated to help God's people remember their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. So let's take a look at what happened that first Passover. Now God's people were in bondage and slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Moses came to proclaim freedom for the Israelites. <coughs> However, Pharaoh was not about to let his chief help fly out the coop that easily. So God then brings down a number of plagues upon the people of Egypt. But still, Pharaoh would not let God's people go. Finally, God brought about a plague that would break the will of Egypt. The plague of death to all the firstborn in Egypt. Which included both man and animal. Now if we take a look at Exodus chapter 12, God tells Moses to have the Israelites sacrifice a male animal that was without blemish or defect and use some of the blood of the animal and put it on the sides and top of the door frames of their houses. When the spirit of death came down as the last final plague and recognized the blood on the door frame, it would pass over the home and allow all the people and animals who are inside to be spared from death. And it was because of this miracle from God which then caused Pharaoh to, to release all of the Israelites and they became a free people once again. So when God's people celebrated this awesome miracle every year, they would do this with a special meal. For over 1,500 years, God's people had observed the Passover. And Jesus also celebrated this special meal with his disciples. However, the old ways, the old meal, and the old covenant were about to be brought to a whole new level. And this special meal was now about to take on a greater and fuller meaning. And that's exactly why Jesus chose a supper such as this to be used as the memorial feast to remember him and what he has done for us. And Jesus was very excited about having this special meal with his disciples. If we take a look at Luke chapter 22, verse 15, Jesus says this, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. Now this word very eager comes from the Greek word epithumia, which actually translates into meaning to have a deep longing and desire. The context is of looking forward to something so excitedly that it hurts. And that's how much Jesus was looking forward, forward to this special meal with his disciples. And Jesus was very eager 
because he had a great desire for his disciples to know the true meaning of the Passover. For years, the Jewish people had only celebrated the deliverance of a particular event for a particular time. So the first Passover was really only a shadow of the true Passover to come. However, now the real thing was here. The true Lamb of God was standing right before them, and the real Passover was about to be celebrated. Just as the, the 1,500 previous Passover meals were intended to be a reminder of God's promise fulfilled, so now the celebration of the Lord's Supper would be a reminder that God's promise had once again been fulfilled. And that God's people would now be reunited with him in relationship. Now with this context in mind, we're going to be able to see three promises that the Lord's Supper will help us to remember. The first promise is that communion affirms God's love. And normally at a Jewish <coughs> Passover meal, a person is designated to ask this question to start the meal. Why is this night different from all other nights? And the presider answers by explaining the significance of the Jews eating the Passover meal <coughs> in Egypt years ago. A little later, the presider holds up a loaf of unleavened bread and explains, this is the bread of affliction which your fathers ate in the wilderness. So when Jesus held up the loaf of bread in front of his disciples during the Passover meal, they expected to hear those words. This is the bread of affliction. However, that's not what Jesus proclaimed. Instead, Jesus says in verse 19, this is my body, which is given for you. So imagine the startled looks that would have appeared on the faces of the disciples. Now just a little later in the meal, one of the four ritual cups of wine is shared. However, once again, instead of explaining its usual significance, Jesus says this in verse 20, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Church, whenever we celebrate communion, we are reminded of the death of Jesus. The Passover was a reminder of the blood that saved the Jews from the spirit of death. The Lord's Supper is a reminder of the Lamb of God who shed his blood on the cross to save us from death and the judgment of our sins. The Bible reminds us of this truth in the first book of Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 26. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And that's why I use those words in concluding the words of institution when we celebrate communion ourselves. <clears throat> As Lutherans, we believe in the real presence of Jesus in the bread and in the wine. If we take a look at the Book of Concord, which is the doctrinal summary of what Lutherans believe, it says this in what we call Lutheran's small catechism in section 6. Now, what is the sacrament of the altar? The answer is, it is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in and under the bread and wine, which we Christians are commanded by Christ's word to eat and to drink. And so... This promise that Jesus is with us. It's a promise that he is with, with us each 
And every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, and this affirms God's love for us. The second promise that the Lord's Supper gives us is that it affirms our faith. Throughout history, the Jews remembered what God had done for them by celebrating the Passover. But the Jewish people still closely identified themselves with that deliverance. And so they proclaimed this during the Passover meal. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord, our God, took us out from there with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm. Something similar is affirmed when you and I come to the table of Jesus. We proclaim our faith when we take the bread and wine, that, that we remember and believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And that's why Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 22, verse 19, do this in remembrance of me. And the third promise we have from celebrating the Lord's Supper is that it affirms our salvation. In the upper room that Thursday, Jesus told his disciples in verse 18, I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. Through the bread and the wine, Jesus points us to the future. Jesus directs our thoughts to the time when everything will be brought to fulfillment. So he asks, asks us to think about when he will return to take us all home. Throughout the Bible, God uses the image of a wedding to express the intimate relationship between him and his people. Let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 32. And God says this, They broke that covenant, though I love them as a husband loves his wife says the Lord. In the book of Revelation, the Bible tells us that all will be brought to fulfillment and a wedding finally takes place. A wedding that is between God and his people. Take a look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. This tells us this. The Bible tells us, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. So when Jesus says he will not drink wine again until the kingdom comes, he is referring to that day when he celebrates the wedding supper with us in heaven. There's a man named A.T. Pearson who was one of the great preachers of the late 19th century. And he said this, the link between the cross and the crown is the table of the Lord. Do not forget when you sit down at communion that the bread and the cup point back to Christ's accomplished work and forward to your accomplished salvation. And so we affirm our salvation each and every time that we partake of the bread and wine at communion. Folks, communion is all about a covenant between us and God. A covenant where God promises to save us, provide for us, and to always be with us when we come to Him in faith. The bread and the wine affirm God's love for us. The sacrament also affirms our faith and our salvation. And that's a covenant and a promise that God makes for each one of us. So Jesus tells us, do this in remembrance of me. And what we are to remember is the mission of Jesus in coming to this world which he proclaims in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God loved the world so much 
that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And that's why we celebrate communion. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of the holy sacrament of communion, knowing that each and every time we receive the bread and wine, we are in the presence of your holy son, Jesus. Father God, we are sorry when we downplay this awesome promise from you by treating the celebration of communion as just one more box to tick in our Sunday ritual. Lord, help us to always remember, through communion and prayer, the incredible sacrifice you made for us when your one and only Son died on the cross, taking upon himself all of the sins of the world so as to give us that covenant, that promise, that for all who believe in the gracious act of that, your gracious act of love, they will have the forgiveness of all of their sins and the promise of eternal life with you in heaven. Thank you, Lord. And it is in the holy name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. <coughs> <coughs> next hymn is Go to Dark Gethsemane. Still working out of the green hymn number 109.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, we just ask you to be a part of us as we, as we come here on Monday, Thursday, and continuing Holy Week, Lord. And let us remember that, that it's not about what we're doing here, Lord. And we're singing the songs and, and feeling everything that you're sending us and putting on our hearts. And it's not about just being here. It's about bringing it out to its front doors and sharing that truth of what happened on Easter season. Help us, Lord, to be strong as we walk out those doors and our wisdom people. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, we especially pray for all those who are mourning at this time of year. We've, we've lost a lot of loved ones at this time of year, Lord. And so sometimes the Passion Week brings about a passion of mourning as well, Lord. So we're asking you to send your Holy Spirit down to all of those people who are mourning the loss of, of loved ones. Lord, we especially pray for the family of of Margaret at this time as we celebrate her joining you in heaven this Saturday, Lord. Touch them, be with them, Lord. Touch all of us who are mourning at this time, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord God, we also ask your Holy Spirit to come down and touch all of those who are in need of your healing to touch. Lord God, let your Jehovah Rapha come down. Touch all of those people who are in hearts and minds at this time in need of your healing touch, whether that's in body, mind, or spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we continue to pray for this nation. We've turned away from you, Lord. We ask you to come down and hear our prayers as we pray for this nation to turn back to you, Lord. We also pray for all those soldiers that are fighting on those front lines for we're putting their lives on their line for us, Lord. Help us to be able to stand by them as they stood by for us. Lord, we pray for all those soldiers who are out on the streets serving for us. <laughs> Difficult time and a lot of people on the road, Lord. And there's there law enforcement personnel, fire department, ambulance personnel who are putting their lives on the line serving us. Lord, we ask you to protect them and keep them safe. Lord, we also ask you to protect all the soldiers fighting on the front lines for your gospel truth. Those missionaries that we support individually and as a congregation, <laughs> Father, protect the health, Lord, health of the families, protect them from me, human evil, and the darts of Satan. Protect them on their travels, Lord, and please provide them with the resources that they need to do those ministries you've called them to. All these prayers, Lord, we ask for your mercy, Lord, and your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. If there's anyone has any prayers that they would like to make at this time, please go ahead and say them. Into your hands, O oh Lord. We commend all for whom we pray. Trusting in the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. Please share the peace of God with one another.
Merciful Father, Merciful Father, we are joy of the what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our feast. Renew now our zeal in faith and life, and bring us to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. And so, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending view.
We'll be celebrating communion today by intention. Give you a way for which you can dip into the wine, swallow both elements, and you can return to your seat from there. All who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are welcome to his table. Come, his table is ready. <laughs> Blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Amen. Oh, I went a little early on the Lord's Prayer, didn't I? But it's so good! <laughs> so, thank you for allowing that. So we're just going to go right into the benediction. If I could have you please rise as you are. <laughs> May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and give you his everlasting strength and peace. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, our closing hymn is Were You There? Working out of the Greek hymnal, page our number 92. The last verse we are going to sing a cappella. And it's during this time that the altar is going to be stripped and have it ready for the Good Friday service. After that's completed and, and the hymn is, is completed, we can just all leave quietly at that time. I think I'll see you all again tomorrow. Mm -hmm.
Where you 